Hello, one and all. It is me, Stephanie. And before we start to set our soul free, I want to remind you to don't forget to subscribe to the channel, click the like, and leave a comment. Also, don't forget to hit the little notification bell so you know when new videos post. As always, I know we won't always agree, and that's okay. Man wasn't meant to always agree with one another. That's what makes our world that God created unique because everyone has a difference of opinion and I'm okay with that. Leave your comments so we can keep the conversation going. Remember, it's not about me. It's about you. It's about our youth. It's about setting our souls free with me, Stephanie. So let's get into it. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Wherever you are, in whatever part of the country you may be living in, I greet you and say thank you for blessing me with your presence. It is time to set your soul free with me, Stephanie. So let's see what we can be blessed with today. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night. Wherever you are, wherever part of the world you are in, I greet you. It is time to set your soul free with me, Stephanie. So, hello, hello, hello. Long time no see, no hear from. Let's pick up where we left off last. We talked about learning things from a different perspective, talking about the, the Texas shooting and everything, which went along with what I said before then about let us explain. So let's go back to that part. As an update, I have no problem being proven wrong. I wish I was proven wrong. And in this case, I was sort of. When I made the comment that we could probably get an app or something on these social media pages for people to report things that are out of the ordinary than it would be for them to pass a gun law. Well, I was proven wrong, which is all right. They did agree on a gun law. Now, of course, it's not going to make everybody happy, and that's okay. It's the point that they came to an agreement to do something. You have to start somewhere. So this is where they started, and it's okay. You know, it's the, everybody's not going to be happy. They're going to find something to nitpick about it, and that's okay. But at least it's a start. Now, with that, so many other things are going on. It's like the world is going to hell on a bullet train. And to me, I think it's because everybody's getting the freedom back. You know, people are still forgetting that we're in a pandemic, but... Because, you know, the mass mandates have been loosened up a bit. People are free to go about and sit in restaurants and go to concerts. Everybody has just lost their rabbit mind. It's about like how it was when the pandemic started and everybody was confined to their homes and everybody had to start working remotely. Everybody went berserk then, too. But what people are not understanding is the toll that is taken on our youth the toll that it has taken on our seniors. You know, the youth are used to socializing. Social media is okay. But, you know, they did in-person stuff. They saw their friends. They did this. They did that. That got taken away. They started losing their mind. Our seniors, who were used to going out when they wanted to, doing this when they wanted to, now are confined to their house, and some of them live alone. And they're starting to go off the deep end. We need to remember that not everybody is as strong as we are. You know, I'm a hermit by nature. So to me, when we were in lockdown, I'm like, well, y'all live in my world. I'm, I, don't mind, I, I'm not, I don't mind staying at home. I stay at home, I stay out of trouble. But then there were people who are not used to that and we started having these problems. And now the world has still, it still hasn't gotten better. So I still need our God-fearing people to stand up. We have been silent for so long that the world has forgotten that there are still God-fearing people here. 
and we're not doing what we were called to do. Which it does not mean necessarily to lay down your life because some people will do that willingly. Some people may have to think about it. But it does mean standing up for what you know is right. And for those who have heard me before, you know, I don't have a problem standing by myself. I don't have a problem at all. But we have to stand up for what we know is right. We have to be the ones to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves, be the strength for those who don't have that strength. You know, we have to do that because by doing that, we're being that light in someone else's darkness that, you know, what's the perfect example? The perfect example is all these court cases. You know, when court cases start, it may start off with one or two plaintiffs going against the defendant. But once those one or two get to going, then you got three and four, seven and 12. 15 and 20, you got in it and, and all because it took one person to stand up for what was right to get the courage for others to do the same. Evil is the same way. It only takes one person to do something evil to bring out the evil that was in another person that may have been suppressed. But now they see that this person's doing it. Okay, that means I can do it. The same thing can go for doing good. When one person stands up for what is right, others will follow. Much as people hate to hear it, every group needs a leader. That leader has to be someone strong that when oppression starts to get to them, they can still do what they need to do. It just bounces off of them. It doesn't bother them. Somebody needs to be that leader. And then you have those who are the followers. They are the ones who will be the foot soldiers. They are the ones whose gift is getting stuff done in the background. They're good at what they do, but standing in the front is not their forte. That's why you have some of these groups that do so well, because they have that one strong leader where you can say what you want to say. You can call them everything, but what's on their birth certificate is not going to bother them. They're still going to do what they need to do. And in the background, you got the foot soldiers doing the work, getting other people to join the cause when they see that there's, okay, somebody's actually going to speak out against this. Okay, I'm going to join the cause and be with them. It's And it's all good things, but we have got to get control of this world because we're losing and we're losing big. And I guess the next biggest thing that came up was this Roe versus Wade, this abortion thing. O-M-G. If you think, and it's like what your parents always say, for one good thing, there's four or five bad things. You finally agree on something about a gun law, but then you take away a woman's right to do something. Okay, something's got to give. And this is where if it ticks you off enough, you need to stand up and say something. If it doesn't make any sense to you, you need to stand up and say something. Long have the days passed where you're like, okay, well, that doesn't pertain to me. If you're living and breathing this toxic air, it pertains to you. You can no longer depend on people to speak on your behalf because their intentions are totally different from yours. Your, their motives is totally different from yours. We have got to do more because it's not about us anymore. It's about the children. It's, it's not, it has nothing to do with us anymore. It's, it's now whatever goes on now is going to affect our children, their children, the children's children. It's, it's, it affects everything from here on out, and we have to do something. It's amazing that I love to see the young people stand up. The young people protest peacefully, most of the time more peacefully than the adults. But it's great that the young people are standing up, but why are they doing it? Things that they're standing up for is something the adults should be doing. Why are the adults not doing it? Because the adults can't get along. Instead of protesting peacefully, we're yelling at each other. We're cussing. We're fighting. We're destroying property. That does not make any sense. Did you notice when the young people started standing up? I can't remember what it was exactly, but it, it was the biggest mess that the next thing you know, you saw young people protesting peacefully. You see cops out there, not for the young people, but to protect the young people. They weren't out there to go against them because somebody's like, okay, you got these young people causing issues. They was out there to protect those young people. 
because they were showing the adults, this is what's going on. We can't depend on you because y'all don't do nothing but yell at each other and nobody's hearing what the other is saying. So we got to do it ourselves. And it's sad when it has to be that way, but I'm glad that they're doing it because at some point when we're gone away from here, they're going to have to pick it up where we left off if we even bothered to start it in the first place. So we got so many other things. It's like, don't lose sight of the big picture. And the big picture is everybody still ain't free. And it doesn't matter what your race is. It doesn't matter what your gender is. It does not matter. If you're breathing this toxic, sin sick air in this planet, in this world, it's pertaining to you. You may not want to recognize it. You may not want to believe it, but it pertains to you. So when are you going to let somebody speak for you and you can't speak for yourself? Now we're mad for a totally different reason because something else passed, but it wasn't what we wanted. Well, why didn't you say something? You know, there's a whole bunch of things we can go over and prayer in schools. Oh, let's not get me started on that one. That I'm going to say for another day because I am so tired of hearing about that, but that's not, that's not what we're going to talk about today. Today, we're going to talk about, you know, catching up on things that's been going on. And I'm still saying, still pray for those families who lost those babies. And then there's been other shooting since then. It's like everybody is going back to the OK Corral. Everybody's shooting up the old Wild West. Everybody done went Clint Eastwood, Chuck Norris, Pierce Bronson. Everybody done lost their mind. Just shooting everywhere. Then you got the babies out here in Tennessee over on Dickinson Road where a 16-year-old stabbed a 14-year-old to death and they didn't even know each other. What in the world is going on? It goes back to what I said. The village no longer has the elders. Everybody is too scared to do something about somebody else's child, which, don't get me wrong, in this day and age, I understand because the children got it from somewhere and they probably got it from home. But the village is is still there, but it's like a ghost town. Because, you know, when I was growing up, the village, was, I, they didn't care. They didn't care if you got mad. They did not care. You knew what you were supposed to do. You knew what you weren't supposed to do. And they were there to correct you. Then they told your parents when they got home, which made it worse. Because in your parents' eyes, you sat there and embarrassed me in front of these people. Now I got to deal with you, too. See, and that's how we learn growing up. You don't act a donkey out in public because somebody knows you and somebody knows your parents. Thank God we did not have the phones like they do now where they can actually show your parents. Do you see what your child is doing? We don't have that anymore. Too many parents don't want to be their friend. Too many parents want to go out with them, be buddies with them, probably the same size as their children. So they're wearing clothes, going, you doing the same thing they're doing. You too busy trying to be their friend that when it's time to be the parent, it's too late. You know, you don't let them get away with so much stuff. Now they don't respect you at all. And now that now it becomes a problem. Should have dealt with it before I got that far. I wish I would say something to my mama. Like, I wish I would. I wish I would look at her cross-eyed. I'd probably be cross-eyed permanently. I wish I would. But you don't have that anymore. Parents want to be buddies instead of being parents. Friends want to be They ace spoon coon. They ride or die. Instead of telling a friend, you need to cut that out. That's 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 not gonna work. You know, when our kids leave our presence, and I've said this many a times, I've been on many speaking engagements where I say the same thing every time. We don't know what goes on when our children leave. When they are out of our house, when they are in school, when you're letting them go hang with some friends, even now, because people are so brave, when they're in the front yard, you do not know what they're hearing, what they're seeing. You don't know. And now we're on the news crying, trying to figure out, well, what happened? What did they do? My child's not my child. Well, had you paid attention, you would have known. You know, there are so many things that is going on that we have control over. But for some reason, we don't want to, to do anything. And it's sad that some parents are actually scared of their children. You know, instead of the parent ruling the house, it's the child ruling the house. You know, the way a child talks to an adult is the same way they talk to you. And they're looking at you like, really? This is what's going on in the house. It's like I told you once before, when 
people were bullying my child. And I'm like, nope, that, that I, I'm old school. We don't roll like that. I don't care who your parent is. When I get done with you, call your parent. I'll take care of them too. We don't play like that. You may not respect your parent, but you're going to doggone respect me. And then I saw the children. Like I said, it was like a PTA or something. And me and the hubby and the kids were there. And we saw the child and how they were acting. And then we heard the parents and how they were acting. I'm like, well, no wonder. The child is learning from the parent, which means that house is off the chain. I'm like, no, couldn't get my kids out of that school fast enough. I'm like, this is like South Central Compton, Los Angeles. Nope, we're not doing this. Nope. This is, we, we, we ain't supposed to be a part of this because I see where this is going and it does not end well. So no. And I couldn't pull them out fast enough. I'm like, uh-uh. No. Because it got to the point where there was things the teachers couldn't even control the kids. Because I was there once for something else. And I'm hearing the, whatever they call those intervention teachers, talking about why would you talk to her that way? That is your teacher. And I'm like, seriously? Really? Everything that is going on with our youth, even these adults, starts at home with what they see, what they hear you say. You know, growing up, I wish you would repeat something you heard in that house. That'll be the last thing your lips ever say. They don't do that no more. Parents just talk about everything in front of the child. Child's so confused. They don't know what's going on. Nobody's parenting anymore. Everybody wants to be friends. Everybody wants their child to like them. I don't care if you like me or not. That ain't what I was put on here for. That ain't what God blessed me with you for. He blessed me with you to lead you in the way that you needed to go. And I'm supposed to take you there. I'm supposed to teach you. So when I let you loose on the world, you do what you know you're supposed to do. If you don't like me in between that, that's your problem. I ain't got nothing to do with it because you're going to need me before I'll ever need you. So my children learned at an early age. I wish you would. Put your lips together like you fence to say something back. Talk back to me if you want to. But they don't do that anymore. And because of that, we're having these, these young girls dressing the way they want to. The young boys half dressing the way they want to. It's just so much going on because everybody's scared to say something. That's why I love the babies in my ministry. I love the adults. And I love my seniors. I, for some, when I started this journey, it started off as youth and young adults. That was my genre. That was my specialty. It still is. But over time, as those babies grown up and they've had babies and now I'm ministering to the cousins of the babies and it's, it's like I got so many generations going through. It changed. And it changed because God said, he, you know, I was ready, which goes into what I said. The other thing we're going to talk about is the calling. It goes into what God said I was ready to do. Meaning you've done what I asked you to do. Now I need you to go to the next level. Because once these children become adults, they are still going to have to need somebody. That's another problem that we have with our youth and young adults. They don't have anybody to talk to. The one thing I tell my young people is do not listen to your friends. They don't know no more about what's going on than you do. And if they're telling you stuff, it's because of what they heard. So now both of y'all walking around confused and wrong and angry for no reason. They don't have no one to talk to. They don't have that mentor. They don't have that counselor. They don't have that confidant that they know if I come to them with a real question, I'm going to get a real answer. I love being that minister, preacher, whatever you want to call me, that is out of the box. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Now, other people in the ministry don't, but I do. When the young people or even adults, when they come to me and they got a problem, I'm not sitting up here talking in King James. Yo, you know it that the Lord hath said it. I don't nobody talk like that. I don't like that when I was growing up. If I ask you a question, give me an answer. I don't need five pages of scriptures because by the end, I don't forget what I asked you. Talk to me. So I love it when they come to me, they know I'm going to be real with them. Because I want to make sure when you leave me, you know exactly what is going on, because I'm not for sure that neither one of us will see each other again. So I need to make sure you understand what's going on before you walk away from me, because I don't know what the devil may throw at you when you walk out that door. I don't know what blessing God may have for you when you walk out that door. But I want to make sure that your question is answered. 
all your questions. And they, we've, we've sat and talked for, I know I talked to one person that was a senior, called him on a Sunday. Cause there's, I do calls now where I call, I call this person on Sunday. We talked, I know it was probably about four hours later before we realized we'd been on the phone that long. But it was one of those conversations that it was never no downtime. There was never no pause in the conversation. The conversation kept going because everything that was said fed off the other. So it was it was spirit fed when we both felt good afterwards. You know, I may have been calling them to assist them, but at the same time, they assisted me. You know, and that's that's the kind of reverend preacher, whatever you want to call me, that I am. You know, I'm that motivational speaker because my job is to motivate you to get up and do something. My job is to inspire you to know that you're not fenced to be in this journey by yourself. I'm right there with you. One of my other mottos for the ministry is from the cradle to the grave. From the time you take your first breath to the time you take your last, I'm right there in between helping you along the way. Because I knew what it was like when I was growing up. There are things I went through that my parents still have no clue about because I didn't talk to them. And that's another thing I keep trying to educate my parents about. If your child comes to you, please don't act a donkey because that'll be the one and only time they may ever come to you for anything. Then the next thing that goes on, you're trying to figure out, well, why come you didn't talk to me? Well, you remember the last time they said something to you and you embarrassed them? Our youth these days are not taking that do as I say, not as I do mentality. I didn't take it. When I was younger, I couldn't stand that. That, that ooh, that's one of my pet peeves. Do not say that to me. Because if you're telling me to, to do as you say and not as you do, then you shouldn't be doing it. And if you are choosing to do it, you should not be up in this pulpit saying you're a prophet or prophetess for God because I'm not listening to you anymore. Because apparently you don't know what you're supposed to be doing and this is not it. This is, this is not the job for you. We have got to listen to our youth. And we all have some young people that, we see something's going on. We do. We, there's not a young person, a person that's listened to me now or that's been on the blog or has listened to the podcast or who I've spoken to personally. There's not a young person that you don't know that is different. Something about them has changed. You don't know what it is, but something about them has changed, but you did not go up and talk to them. There is a difference between talking to them and interrogating them. Please believe there is a difference. What you do not want is to go up and interrogate a child instead of talking to them. And then they shut down completely to where they don't talk to anybody. We see what happens when that happens. Mass shootings, suicides, bullying, cyberbullying. Don't do that. There's a way that you can talk to them that they will tell you what's going on or tell you enough that you can figure it out and still help. Again, that's what I do. Motivational speaker, inspirational speaker, cuckoo off the chain, whatever. That is what I do. And I don't have a problem using my life and the ignorant, dumb, stupid things I did to show them that even though I did the things that I did, I'm still here. And it's only because of the, the goodness, grace, and forgiveness of God that I'm still here because I've done some ignorant, dumb stuff. Not personally, but being a part of people who did dumb stuff. They should have put me in my grave. But God saw fit. My child is ignorant. She's being a ding a right about now. Let me remind her whose she is. And I'm still here to talk about it. So that's why I said, I don't, I'm not ashamed of nothing I did. It was my choice. It wasn't like I was forced to do anything. My dumb butt just did it. But I'm here to tell them about it. You know, so they can learn. There's nothing wrong with being by yourself. When you go into a school building, you don't have to be around a whole lot of people. I have so many phobias and issues. Ugh. But it's not something that's made up. It's something because of things that happened in my life that I saw. Things that I witnessed, things that I was a part of, even though I wasn't a part of it willingly. And because of those things, it turned me into what I am today. Why I cannot do certain things, why I cannot be around a large crowd of people. My nerves are shot. I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. 
so being alone and that's what I have to change. And, and they're learning. They are learning because I'm teaching them to be, to be more watchful. Watch your surroundings. Watch who is around you. Watch who is coming around you and watch who you choose to be around. You need to pay attention to your surroundings. Everyone who comes to you is not there for your good. They're not. It's sad that in this day and age, everybody is trying to, to get something. Everybody is trying to one up the next person. Everybody is trying to, to do something to kick you out of the limelight. And I keep telling my babies, y'all need to be careful, especially my babies that go from middle school to high school. Be careful because the friends you had in middle school are now trying to find new friends in high school. And if those new friends in high school don't like you, but they want to be part of that circle, guess whose business they're getting ready to tell you? Be careful. My babies now that are in, in person who I've talked to who are so concerned about their health because, you know, with the COVID thing, they're not allowed to tell you the student that caught the COVID, but, you know, they, you know, go around and figure out who that child was around and they're telling you and then they're telling your family, but they're not telling you who it was. And a lot of my students that I talked to said that concerned them because they don't know who it was that they were around. And you're telling me, but now what about the people I went around after that person? Who that person may have been around that you don't know about. So it concerned them. It concerned them that they were the ones that have to clean up the desk in between classes. That bothered them too. It's so many things that are going on with our youth that we need to be mindful of, but not just the youth. We need to think about our seniors, the ones who paved the way to get us here, who are being forgotten. You know, most churches are thinking about going out, reaching our youth and young adults, bringing them into the church. And that's another thing that bothers me. Why you got to bring them there? Why come you can't go to them? Some of these kids don't drive. Some of these families go to one church and the other families go to another church. Why come you can't go to them? Jesus went to the people that couldn't come to them. Why come the churches can't do it? That's why I'm on every social media except for TikTok. I just, I can't do the TikTok thing. But social medias, all these other platforms, I'm only there because of my youth. You know, they're the ones that told me about this. This is where I know that they are. So I'm going to where they are. We need to do the same thing, but at the same time, we need to remember about these seniors, these seniors that can't get out, these seniors who are committing suicide, these seniors who all of a sudden are just losing their mind going out doing things to, to, to get caught and hurt themselves. And we need to think about them as well. You know, it's like everybody forgot about the seniors. You forgot about the people that paved the way for you to get to where you are. You know, they're the reason why you are where you are, but nobody's thinking about them. And that's why I love that I got seniors that I go to check on, see how they're doing. Bake them something. Since I have a bakery, I bake them some cookies, bake them a cake, bake them a pie. We sitting up there talking. You know, we, we're doing things. And it's because I'm old school. I'm sorry. That's just, I'm a 70s baby. That's just, that's what we saw. You know, I miss the days where on Sundays after church, you had the big family dinners. You know, I miss the days when we had sunrise service at six o'clock. You had church, you had Sunday school, you ate breakfast, then you hunted for Easter eggs. I miss those days. You know, we don't do that anymore. One is not safe, but we, we, we don't do those things. Anymore. And these kids are missing out on so many things that we did when, when we had fun, you know, enjoying youth. But sadly, you can't even let them play in the front yard anymore without some ignorant person going to snatch them up out the front yard. What sense does that make? I mean, I know I got people that back in the day, you could go outside, stay outside. Kick out, your parents kick you out at nine o'clock in the morning. You better not come in before six o'clock when the street lights come out. They weren't worried about you going away. They weren't worried about nobody snatching you up either. And before the streetlights came on, your toe better have been in the door. We can't do that. They're not even safe in the front yard, the backyard. They ain't even safe in the house. And it makes no sense. We, as children of God, need to stand up. We have let things go on way too long. That it's, it's like the children. It's like the parents with the children being the friend that you let them do something for so long, for so long, for so long that finally you try to discipline. Well, it's too late. You let them do it too long. What you did, what, why are you going to change it now? And it's how it is with the world today. We've let things go on for so long that it's going to be just as long for us to get it back the way it should be. You know, everybody should feel safe in their own home. Everybody should feel safe going to the store. Everybody should feel safe going to their car at night because they had to do an errand and they got to go out. They should feel safe without worrying about somebody bopping them over the side of the head for whatever reason. 
but we're not. You should feel safe on a college campus. You're going there to learn. You're not going there to have tick issues because you don't know if somebody's going to jump out from around the corner. That's not what you go to school for. And it's sad that that's what it turns into. That now kids, our kids are not even safe in the school no more without some crazy person wanting to shoot up the place. And you know what? God forgive me because no, not all of them are crazy. They're not. Some of them are trouble. Which brought us back to the Texas shooter that I talked about the last time. When I said, let's talk about it from a different perspective. Think about that shooter and think about that shooter's family. That something was going on in that young man's life that he waited to his 18th birthday to do what he did. When he knew what that outcome was going to be. He knew that there was that slim to none chance that he was going to survive it. What went wrong? And it goes back to our babies not having no one to talk to. You know, growing up, I had cousins I would talk to. I talked to my cousins when I talked to my parents. And it goes back to what I said about the young, don't be talking to kids about, don't be talking to other children about the issues. They don't know. They don't know no more than you do. But we have got to earn that trust because in this day and age, once you lose the trust of a young person, it's gone. I have seen it so many times with other people. Once you lose that trust of a young person, they're not telling you nothing ever. That's why I love that I hold myself accountable, but I make sure they hold me accountable. I know when I walk out my door every day, I don't know where these young people are. I don't know who's watching me. I got to make sure that when I'm out in public, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing because I don't know who's watching me. And they've told me on numerous times, they watch what I do. When we was in the church house and they heard how people were talking about me because I wasn't doing what they wanted me to do or they thought my ministry should be this. And I'm like, how are you going to tell me what God called me to do? He called me, not you. And they would hear what they were saying, but they would still see me communicate with them like nothing was ever wrong. And because it bothered them so much, they tried to tell me and I stopped them before they could tell me. No, nope, I know what this is. And they're looking at me like, but you're still talking because why wouldn't I? That's their problem, not mine. They're the ones staying up late at night trying to figure out what they're going to do to try to destroy me. And it doesn't work. And they're trying to figure out why. They know that I know what they see. I said, that's the best revenge a person can have when the person knows that you know. But they're still talking to you like everything's peachy king hunker door. I said, because God got you. I got too many things to do. You petty on my list right now. I can't deal with you right now. I got things to do. Which brings us to the calling. We are all called to be exceptional in gifts bestowed upon us by God. Every single one of us has a gift. It's not like me necessarily to stand in a pulpit and preach. That's not what I was called to do. And it's, I guess that's the stereotype people hear when they, when you hear preachers say, come and accept your calling, they automatically think it's a call to preach. No, no, it's not. You got people that are exceptional evangelisms. They're exceptional in praying, exceptional singers, exceptional speakers. You know, there are different forms of calling and they're not all called to preach, but all of us have a gift. And the gift is something that we're not supposed to keep to ourselves. We are supposed to share it. That's why he blessed us with the gift to share it. And we're not doing that. Because if we were, we wouldn't be in the predicament that we're in now. It'll probably be like it was, what, maybe a good 20 years ago? It was copacetic. Everything was peaceful. You can do, you know, you can run around the yard without worrying about being snatched up. People did stuff. The police knew about it immediately. Person got arrested off the chain. We don't do that anymore. It's time to be faithful, trusting, and diligent in doing what God called us to do. You know what your gift is. You know what God called you to do. And again, it does not mean in a pulpit. I can't tell you. I've been in the ministry over 20 years. And I know the last 15 of it, I've been trying to tell people that's the pulpit is not what I was called. I was not called to preach. I was called to be out in the world. Like I said, I'm a motivational speaker. I'm an inspirational person. I'm the mentor. I'm the counselor. I'm the one that gets out there and find them where they are. You know, I have young people to come to the house and spend the night. We have the most fun. But we also make sure we get things taken care of, too. You know what you're supposed to do this. You know you're supposed to do that. We ask, we have those conversations. And they know that they can trust me. 
that's the part. They have got to have at least one adult that they can trust. And they know they can trust me. They know if it's something they want to tell their parents, but they don't know how. They know if they come talk to me, I got it. I got you. I'm going to lead you in the way that you're supposed to go. But then again, I'll be the one to break the ice with the parent. So the parent knows your child is concerned about something you need to talk to. Them. And that's what opens the door. And so many things have gotten resolved between the parent and the child that the parent didn't know. But the parent knew that they, they had to jump on something because something was bothering the child. My biggest issue that I have ever had is when something bothers them and they're supposed to be in God's house. That's where my problem falls. When my children, I see them earlier in the day and they're fine. They're peachy king, hunky dory. By the time we get downstairs for, for youth church, their demeanor has changed. Their attitude has changed. Or by the time we leave and they're congregating with the family or whatever, and I'm outside and then I see them outside and the, the, the look on their face has changed. Some of them look like they've been crying. Like, whoa, 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 hold it. What the heck? What just happened? You were just fine a second ago. What happened? And at one time they told me it was an adult that did something to them, that said something inappropriate. All but now say, no, I didn't take my Christian robe off. I tightened it up. Because the MAC team was about to clear out that church. And I found that person. Then I went to the pastor and told him, I said, you better handle this before I do. Because if their parent finds out what just happened, that's going to be a whole nother issue altogether. There won't be no youth in this church. It does not matter to me if you're an adult, if you're a senior. You will not disrespect the children. I'm sorry. Especially in God's house. I will not tolerate that. No, I will not. If you cannot talk to a child, you do not be, need to be in a child's ministry. If you don't know how to deal with a child, you do not need to be a Sunday school teacher or you claim you're a youth minister. You don't need to, you don't need to be doing that. You don't, don't, don't do that. We're already being stereotyped as it is. That's the last thing I need is for a child to feel that way. And now they stop coming all together because of the way an adult talks to them. We're not, we're not doing that. That's, that's what we're not doing. So we have Mr. Jason who wants to come in and give his insight, and that is all right with me. Hey, TGITD, thank God for a second. How are you? I am good. How are you? I had a similar experience in youth ministry, so that's why I came up at this point. Um, because, yes, um, um, uh, you know, I'm not sure where you minister, but I was um, uh, ordained in youth ministry in 2011. I think it was about then um, at um, it's Kingdom Covenant Ministries in in Mississauga, in uh, it's west of Toronto, in Ontario, in Canada. Um, I'm I'm not sure if you know where Canada is, but uh, I think yes, I don't know. Most people are from the states, but I don't know where you're from. I'm not going to assume. Okay, I am yeah, in Tennessee. That's a state. So yeah, Canada is a country above you that loves you. We have to love you. You could attack us. <laughs> but but uh, sometimes you get offended. But I was just, just <laughs> all jokes. Uh, but in youth ministry, yes, this happens all the time, right? Is that, uh, you know, I would see, you know, the kids would come and talk to me. And they don't want to be called kids, but the young people, right? Uh, my pastor, you know, would say, we make sure you call them young people. But, you know, I'm 45, so... Everybody's a kid to me, unless they're 45 or older. But the young people, like, you know, because I was in, in ministry, I used to play basketball with them before I was ordained. So I would just play basketball with them. So I look young for my age, right? So in 2010, I was 33, but I looked like 25. So they just saw me as one of the guys. Like, they thought I was like one of the older guys, so 18 or 17, right? And plus, I was on the internet. You can't tell because I was on social media with them. So, you know, I remember one of the guys, he was uh, dating. So they put that they're married on Facebook, right? So I joke around with them. I say, well, you guys are married on Facebook. Because the thing is, they don't take it as a big thing. But then they got divorced on Facebook, I guess, because they broke up. And then it's like the end of the world for some of them, right? When their relationship ends. So because it's so public, they would get, you know, 
they'd get distraught. Then you see them, they're not at church, like they're at school, and then they're not at church. That same one of those guys that broke up with his girlfriend that they said they were married on Facebook, um, he was a scholarship winner and stuff. But because he had just come out, because our he went to our church or school, and like he got had gotten kicked out of the public school system because our church's private school it wasn't for like kids that were, um, like sometimes those schools are elite, like the private Christian schools. But this was a last chance school. It's for kids that got kicked out of the public school system. Not normally not for fighting, but normally for not being there, like truancy. Like they would have like a hundred absences, so they get kicked out. So they get their parents had to pay for them to go to our church's private school. So I had to have a special grace. And I was a gifted kid in terms of like, my dad was a scholarship winner. I was a scholarship winner. So I didn't really know what it was like to not want to go to school. So I found it very challenging, you know, and I was very trusting. So like, I remember one time I put my phone number, right? It was like my first day I put my phone number on the board and a principal came and said, Jason, <laughs> you can't put your phone number on the board. I was just youth, I was used to youth ministry. So the guys could call me at youth ministry. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, I'll stop because I talked too long. So yeah, boy, uh, yeah. You were fine, and I, I understand. Like I said, in Tennessee, we call that an alternative school, where the kids got in trouble, but not in trouble enough to be like officially kicked out of the school system together. And you're right. When they go to that kind of a school, you don't want to put most of your personal information because then that's when the wolves come out. You know, utilize. Oh yeah, so you know what happened. Yeah, <laughs> so I got in trouble because. What, well, no, it, it wasn't a bit bad. Like the principal just came and said, because he was my boss, but he was a principal, but he was also the youth minister, like in charge of like the ministry for the youth. So like he was both, but he had more experience than me. So he knew the difference in separation, but I was new to the separation because the thing is I never went to adults. I never, I did adult education later in 2015, but I never went to teacher's college. They just, the French teacher quit. And I, I minored in French at University of Quebec. Excuse me, donc, parce que je voulais devenir I wanted to be qualified to be prime minister. So I minored in French and I studied at University of Quebec. Excuse me, I did an exchange in five weeks. I became bilingual. So I had French and I knew, I knew how to speak French. So the French teacher quit. So I was serving in ministry. So the, the that pastor, and he was also principal at a school. He asked if I could teach French. And I was I, I had left my job that I was at for five years at a financial institution in Canada. And I just to step out to do adult to do um you know uh co like well training and and uh consulting for Pence Power Club, but then I only found one client and that like the amount of money he could pay me was was dwindling. He was a guy that went to our church and he had his own mechanic business. So I was serving him, and then I realized, oh, I was losing. Like I didn't wasn't making enough. I didn't do cold calling well. I still don't like cold calling. Who likes cold calling? So so what God provided was that job teaching. So at first I was teaching French. One one course I said they said if I could teach French because a French teacher quit suddenly I said oh yeah of course for sure it would that little bit of income would help and then somebody needed a math course credit um, no they needed me to teach math they asked me if I could teach math and I grade ten math and I got a hundred percent in grade ten math so I said of course right and then it was just God because it was all courses I could teach and then they then one student needed an English credit half English credit and it's a small school right it was like. 20 students a grade max. Some of them need like five people in French class that I taught, right? One person, one student needed an English credit. So they added the English credit and it was supposed to be eight, eight to nine and the school was open eight to four, but look at how it was God, right? I was serving at the church for a couple years, serving hard, always like there working for free, essentially, right? In, in ministry. And then, so they asked me to teach French. So that was one class and I had a French classroom. And then they asked me to teach grade 10 math. And then I had that, cl that class. And of course I could do that because, you know, that was my best uh, course ever in high school. And then they asked me to teach this grade 11 English credit, but it was eight to nine. And then they could, the, his aunt who he was sent from New York, he was in a gang or something where he's getting in trouble, kind of like the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. They sent him up to Canada 
right to his aunt and then his aunt was a minister at a church but she would she couldn't get in by 8 a.m so they asked to put it at the end at four to five at after school they asked it was just one student so they said okay they'll arrange it they had a meeting with the principal and with me and she asked if he could we could move the credit from eight to nine first first uh period to four to five this is two hour classes but it was a half credit right so it was just one hour so they put it at the end so i got to work nine to five in the kingdom that was god because they added a, a gym class right it's called healthy active living they added a gym class that he needed me to teach and of course i could do gym i used to play basketball baseball my dad was my baseball coach he made me the mvp have you heard me on the app before no sir oh because so my father was my coach my dad was a uh a scholarship winner from antigua in the caribbean right so i have I did poetry because my dad was a poet too. My dad did poetry in Antigua, in the Caribbean, right? My father was my coach and made me the. This, sometimes I do poetry because it make me make it more concise. My father, my dad just passed away. Um, well, not not no, but Father's Day, I went to his uh, graveside because I lived there near that. Right, I grew up. I went back to the community I grew up in and I bought a, a house in 2016 and I just sold it. And now I'm in a motel close by where I grew up in Pickering, Ontario. It's just east of Toronto, right? I'm president of Toronto Poets. I'm president of Free Shares Incorporated since 1999. It models the kingdom. Every Christian in the world has a free share. It's spelled P-H-R-E Shares Incorporated. So you have a free share if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. I know you don't know, but it's just symbolic, right? I modeled the kingdom and I incorporated it for $1,000 in 1999. It's the first for-profit corporation in the world that I know of that has never charged anyone anything for anything and never will. So I speak English and French and internet. I have the largest collection of free websites in the world, spelled P-H-R-E, because when I went to buy freeshares.com, it was taken. It wasn't a God site. It was a fraud site, right? There were no free shares on there, but two, two kids in my in my neighborhood, Pickering, sold one domain for a million dollars, just the domain.com. Zed.com sold for $6.8 million. I said, if they can do that, I passed a gifted test in grade seven. I was most outstanding student in grade eight. Um, I got 100% in grade 10 math. I got the highest marks in every school that I went to until university. I just graduated with distinction. So I said, if they can do that, I can do better. I was diagnosed with genius illness in 1999. This is speaking slow for me. I have the largest collection of free websites in the world. I haven't sold any of them. I bought all of them in 1999, the PHRE brand. Z.com sold for $6.8 million. I have 40 domains and I sold my house. So I retired at 45. Well, thank you, Mr. Jason. And for those who are just tuning in, basically what Mr. Jason just did is what I was talking about, his calling. He had different callings and he used them, which is what we need to do. So evil and hatred and death has run amok for too long. It is time to restore balance in the world. It's time to get back what the devil stole. For each of us, the devil has stole something. Peace of mind, job, children, finances, homes. The devil has stole something and it's because we let him. It's because we thought we was going to let someone else speak on our behalf. And they had a different motive than ours. They had a different ulterior motive than ours and we're the ones that 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 missed it we need to take back what the devil stole and it starts with our children we need to get them back like i said i'm a mentor i'm an inspiration person i sing i write i'm an author i do just about everything this what i'm all took after me i'm never not working i'm always doing something and it's because of that. It's because I'm accepting my calling. I know what I was called to do. I know what I would have wanted growing up, which is why my ministry is doing well, because I'm giving the youth what I wish I had growing up. That one adult that I know knows what's going on, that can teach me, that can tell me, that can lead me, that I don't have to say something's wrong. They can see it. That's what my youth loves about me. And like Mr. Jason said, you know, calling them the young kids, they know they're my babies. Anybody younger than me, I'm in my 40s, they know anybody younger than me, they're my babies. Even though they're adults now, I still call them my babies, and they have no problem with that. Why? Because of that trust. Because I've shown that they can trust me, and I haven't broken their trust yet. They don't care if I call them, and they don't care if I call them that in public. I've been introduced many of them when I see them looking at my babies and I'm hugging and kissing all on. They don't care. And these are teenagers. You know, by now, teenagers got that so-called image they think they got. They don't care. 
we have got to grab our youth. Now, like I said, y'all have people y'all know, youth, older people that you know that you've grown up with that still ain't quite right. Something's still not right. That you know that you can talk to, that you can grab on to, because all it takes is one. We grab one. That person heals. They know another person that was just in the same situation that they'll either they'll talk to or they'll send them to you. I've had people where I've talked to them. And they've talked to somebody else and they've helped them or they sent that person to me. And I've helped them. But I tell my babies all the time that you go that comes with a disclaimer. Let them know how I am. Because if you say I'm the youth minister or I'm the whatever you the title you give me, let them know I'm not what they think. And I love it when they first come see me and they're looking at me like, okay. I'm like, nope, don't just, I'm not one of those. I'm not going to sit up and act like I'm holier than now because I'm not. That is not what I am. That is not what you need. You want me to give you scripture? I'll give you one, but I'm going to give you life because that's how I learn. I'm going to let you learn through me what I did. And I'll throw a scripture in there to go with it, but we're not going to bombard the whole conversation with it. But we need to grab hold of those youth. We cannot keep affording Youth bullying people on the on the internet. Youth bullying people in the school, and then because these kids have no one they feel they can talk to, they decide to take the law into their own hands to the point where they don't care if they die. Because to them, death is the only way that they can get peace. Which goes back to that shooter in Texas that shot that elementary school. What was going on in that young man's life that he thought that death was the only way he can get his peace? How long was he going through what he was going through? Before he decided on his 18th birthday, today is the day I'm going to die. Where he was okay with that. That's that's not right. And I, I feel so bad for him and I feel so bad for the parents. I feel so bad. Because you did not know, like I told you, and that's going to be, I think I'm going to put that in a depression discussion when I have that discussion. How people like me been depressed. I've been depressed now to be going on eight years. Really longer than that since my youth. But you never know. Because I don't look like it. Nothing about my demeanor has changed. Nothing about my life has changed. You would not know. And that's the problem that parents are not seeing, that their children are depressed, but nothing about them has changed for them to see a sign, to see a signal, to, to see that something is wrong. The signs are there. You know, we give you little hints and things there, you know, to let you know, okay, something's not quite right. I'm not feeling, I'm not feeling it today. But like I said, that's a discussion we'll have at another time, because come July will be nine years since my father passed, and that's when my depression really kicked in the gear. So I'll make sure that that's when we'll we'll talk about that, because I'm going to need my healing, and that's how I know I can get it by talking. Which is one of my, which is one of the other many gifts that God has gave me that I'm just getting around to using. So today we rounded up some things about, you know, what we talked about last time we talked, but then we also talked about the calling because now we need those people of God who have that calling, whether if it's the call to talk, whether if it's the call to finance, whether if it's the call to counsel, you may have a calling of finding businesses that can help people get them out of situations they're in. That's a calling. Any gift you have is a calling and he wants you to share it because there are children, his children are in need, and he's sending them to you because he knows that you can help them. And we need to do that. We need to work on that that calling to, to help somebody because we don't know when that'll happen with us. You know, it's going to come to a point where we're going to need that help, and we're going to hope that somebody's going to be kind enough to help us out of a situation. You know, don't be embarrassed of what you're going through. You're going through it for a reason because somebody else is supposed to go through it and you're stronger than they are. But the next person that may come your way may not be, and they're going to need your help. They're going to need whatever resources you had to get you out to help get them out because you don't know that could be some souls that you could be saving because you could be that person's last hope before they go off and do something that they'll most likely regret. We are now going to have Mr. Adam, who is going to join us and give his insight on what's going on. Hello, Mr. Adam. Hey, thank you so much for having me up. Uh, I love the idea and concept of calling, uh, the calling, and I like the wording of it because 
we don't have to answer it if we don't want to. I feel like I definitely have found my calling. I love working with people to empower them, to really help them find a sense of victory in their lives and to really help them find a community that doesn't treat them like a burden because so many people are invested in like their own stuff so much that sometimes they don't have enough space to offer resources to other people. And my life is mm -hmm. such that I make time and space in my life for people that really need that support. And we thank you. I'm glad that you recognized your calling and you're right. You know, some of us have that calling and we do have that choice. I ran from it for ever before I just accepted the fact that, okay, he's, God's not going to leave me alone until I do what I'm supposed to do. And you're right. Some of us have that calling. Some of us choose to accept it. Some of us do not. But what people need to realize is eventually you will accept that call. Something is going to happen that is going to make you accept it, but you're going to accept it in a way that's going to be comfortable because God's not going to call you to do something and you're uncomfortable doing it. So God bless you, Mr. Adam, for accepting your calling and doing what makes you happy, I'm assuming. Yeah, it definitely makes me so happy, enthusiastic, and inspired and excited. I love watching people succeed when they've had so much doubt and fear in their life. Being able to see someone's journey from having so many doubts, uh, there, it's amazing the amount of shaming that goes on without people even realizing that it's happening. You know, I, I came from a family where my mother really believed that if you shame someone enough, they rebound and try and prove you wrong. When for me, being shamed only caused me to quit and not move forward. And so as I mm -hmm. had people believe in me and support me in a more active, directive way, rather than saying, you need to be this, or you need to be that, or you need to do this, or you need to do that. More like, how can I help you create these different things? How can I support you? What can I do? That type of stuff. I then turned around and became that same person. It's like, hey, look, yes, other people think that by shaming you, you're going to rebound and somehow find this thing. What they don't realize is some people are shoved into these horrible shame spirals that they can't get out of without other people really cheering them on, really creating a reminder of where they add value. And I agree. And for some, and I've seen, and it goes back to when you talk about these criminals and things that they did. Well, it's like what Mr. Adam just said, when you shame them enough, where you tell a child, you're not going to be this, you're not going to amount to this. You're just like your daddy. You're worse than your mama. You're da, 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 da. Sometimes it does not have that effect where they try to prove you wrong. You've done it enough that that's what they think. Well, what's the point of me even bother trying? You're just saying I'm not going to amount to nothing, so why do I even bother trying? And those are the ones that we need to grab because those are the ones that become the most violent because of what they were told time and time again, like Mr. Adams said again, being shamed. Some of them, when it goes back to what I said, some of them are stronger than others. Where some youth like Mr. Adam, you know, were shamed, but they sat there and proved you wrong. Where there's others who may not be as strong as Mr. Adam, and they're like, you know what? Forget it. Since this is what you said I'm not going to do, no matter what I do, no matter what I try, it's never good enough for you, so fine. I'm going to be what you said I'm going to be, and that's what we don't need. We need more of our young people to stand up and stand up for other young people when they see that that's happening. So, Mr. Adam, that is great. Anything else you want to add? I just think along that line that I, I hope that this app, and I honestly have to say I love the Wisdom app. I've been on for now just like a week and a half or so. And just so many people that I've had the ability to connect with, I really appreciate. And I think that having these conversations, talking about callings and kind of engaging with different directions and being supported in that, is really important. I love the concept of mentorship to help self-esteem, that offering mentorship at a younger age, I'd like to see mentorship being promoted in schools for those kids that need the help from a person rather than just told that they should learn and go to college as a way to succeed. 
I agree. I so agree because I my self esteem sucks. It's just horrible. So when I tell people about self esteem, I'm like, I'm the perfect person to teach about self esteem because I like it myself. So let's all grow together. But uh, it's but it's like what you said. What I seen in schools, you know, with the young kids and the bullying, and I've helped them with that too because I've been done. I've been through that stage too. I'm still going through it with adults. That's so sad when you and you're supposed to be in the ministry and you're still dealing with people trying to bully you around. But it's what the kids need to see. It's one of the things that adults try to hide from them. They need to see that you're going through what they're going through. They need to see how you are going to handle it so it helps them find a way to handle it. Plus, you don't know, like Mr. Adams said, with that mentoring thing, if they're seeing what you're going through, that helps them open their mouth to ask you questions, you know, to let you into their life a little bit so you can figure out, okay, I knew something was wrong, but now they're, you know, they're seeing what you're going through and they're expressing, you know, little tidbits. You know how kids do when they try to, my friend, or they try to give a hypothesis kind of situation where now they're, they're opening up so they can get the help. They can get the mentoring. They can get the counseling. They got that one adult, like I said, that they know is going to help them, not judge, but help them with the situation that they're in, even if it means helping them find a way to relay it to the parent so the parent can step in. What are your thoughts, Mr. Adam? I would love the parent to be able to step in. But as someone who was raised and was bullied more by his parent than even going through school and other students, I think we have to find a way to navigate and protect kids, sometimes even from their their own families. That sometimes there's um, someone really believes that negative reinforcement is going to be the solution. And so how do we add or circumvent or engage with that? Because my mother was a teacher, and when I wasn't good in school, it was punishment, punishment, restriction, restriction, attack, attack. You'll never amount to anything if you don't do this. And it it was it, it's amazing that we don't talk about the idea that challenging someone or punishing someone is automatically going is automatically going to create change. We have to be able to engage with different systems depending upon which Child is which. I'm not saying that it doesn't work for some children, but it definitely didn't work for me. Uh, again, I, I think that we we have to be able to figure out how do we help our children access what their own unique skills are, because I believe every child has skills or has a perception or has something that they can celebrate in themselves if we dig hard enough in it, and then because of the the limited awareness and perception and experience of parents sometimes we have to actually present that in the schools we have to have professionals that are trained and focused and actually pursuing that you are right and you and i agree with you too because i've seen that too where being at home was worse than what they were facing in school and that's why those kids normally gravitate to other children you know, my children may say that I'm strict because, you know, you only get two hours over the weekend for social media or any kind of technology. You ain't supposed to be living in no TV. Whereas to them, it's strict to a child. Like you said, in their household, they would love it if their parents paid any attention to them. And you're right. Sometimes the parent is more abusive than what they're dealing with in the school system. So they try to gravitate to somewhere else. And they know my I've got so many babies that I should be fine i got so many children but that's that's my heart babies are my heart i will not let no child go hungry you will be clothed you will be loved if you're not getting it from home you're gonna definitely get it from me well i can i can tell you that i would have loved to have had the experience of someone like you in my in my life and i want to thank you for being that person as someone who didn't have the resource of someone in my community to help me with my struggles so i i so many people don't say thank you for your service, but I really want to tell you what you're doing is being of service in different ways. It sounds like you're just have all these different options, but I, I just want to thank you as my time's running out. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me up and, you know, Well, you are welcome, Mr. Adam. I may not have been there in the beginning, but I'm with you now. So now you got me and you can't get rid of me. So congratulations. <laughs> 
and that's that's that goes back to what I said that my genre started off with youth and young adults, but then as I guess as as I got better at what what God called me to do, He started throwing in adults. Then when I started doing good with the adults, then He started throwing in seniors. That's why I love that that my calling wasn't to stand in no pulpit because there's only so much you can do standing in the pulpit. I like going out amongst the people. This is what I do. You know, this is what I'm good at. Although I'll tell you in a heartbeat, I don't like public speaking, but hey, look what I'm doing. But it's it's all about the calling. All of us have gifts and those gifts expound on other gifts and those gifts expound on other gifts. And I'm standing here as a living testimony. When you do what God called you to do, there is unlimited blessings that come with it. It's like we are forever in learning and training with God that once we pass this level, once we get to this level, then the next door opens. Once we pass what he wants us to do with that, then the next door opens. And that's how it's been for me that I'm playing catch up. God called me probably over 20 years ago. And I fought with him up until the last 20, you know, 18 or so. And because I've recently done what he wanted me to do that he wanted me to do four years ago, blessings have come left and right and left and right. I'm still trying to catch up. And that's what happens when you do what God calls you to do. The blessings are still there. It's being held up by a doorstop because you ain't done the first thing he told you to do yet. But the minute you start doing what you're supposed to do, the blessings start coming one after another as you complete each task he gives you, the next blessing comes. You're going to have to face your fears. Lord knows I'm still facing it. One of them is what I'm doing now. Speaking to people. Being on YouTube. Being in front of people talking and singing. and whew, All of those fears. But because it's blessing people, that overtakes the fear I have. And because I show God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to step out on faith. I'm going to face these fears. The next blessing comes. When I do what he wants me to do with that one, the next blessing comes. So I'm standing here as a living testimony. Do not be afraid of what your calling is. Somebody out there is needing your help. Somebody out there is needing someone like you because of what they're going through. And they're needing a strong person to help. And you're that person. We have Mr. Jason coming back again to us, which is great. When I get this thing to work, you know, I'm still learning on this wisdom thing too, so forgive me, people. So we have Mr. Jason. Welcome back, yes. Mr. Jason. Yes, you're going well. You're doing well, Stephanie. And you know what? It's just like Moses, right? Moses said he couldn't speak, and then he went and spoke straight to Pharaoh. Notice with this, Moses said he couldn't speak. It's interesting. He said that, okay? Just right off the bat, <laughs> people say they can't speak. I'm like, okay, am I a geek? Am I a nerd? That I ner think that's absurd when you say it. It's one thing if you wrote it down. <laughs> you understand the irony, right? <laughs> but Moses said he couldn't speak. Did you ever see that when they said Moses went to speak to Pharaoh, that he got a translator and he got... Aaron, because God was just trying to comfort him and said, look, your brother Aaron can speak just so he would stop saying he wasn't able to do it. Right. But when he went and he spoke to Pharaoh, it didn't say he whispered in Aaron's ear, let my people go. And then Aaron said, hey, Moses whispered in my ear, Pharaoh, let the people of Israel go. No, he could speak. Listen, of course he could speak. He was raised in Egypt. And he had all of the best teachers. So, of course, he could speak. There was no ever, ever ad, ad, evidence when he was in Egypt that he couldn't speak. He spoke to defend somebody that was that when the when the two Hebrews were fighting, he spoke. And that's why they knew he got involved. Right. And that's why he had to flee, because you understand. So just like Moses said he couldn't speak. And he wasn't articulate or whatever. And God said, okay, whatever. Your brother Aaron can speak, right? You're the same way. Because I hear you speaking just fine. I'm not reading what you're writing. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Right. So, I like it. Right. So the thing is, not only could Moses speak, but he spoke straight to Pharaoh. And because he did what he was created to do, Pharaoh couldn't kill him. 
Let me tell you, teach you a principle, and you could tell me if you disagree it's, that it's biblical, but I started reading the Bible December 1st, 1986. Somebody just judged me and said on their talk, how is what I'm saying relevant? So it's uh, fine. I just put my worst foot forward. And then if the person doesn't judge me like the first time, then I can come back. But if they judge me like that time, the person said I was what I was saying is not relevant because I said I worked at Microsoft and they didn't understand how Bill Gates. I don't understand why everything I say is relevant. Look, don't you think that if you never, if you always accepted your calling from the time you were in grade three, you could speak on any podcast and say something that was relevant you would never have gotten tipsy or drunk i don't know if you did i don't know what you were refusing the calling but i never refused the calling my grade five book was prophetic and it was about a boy that came upon a well and he wished out wishing for things he was too poor to go to school he wished that eventually he could go to school and then at school he learned what prime ministers did and he said wow they have power so he was like what people think, right? That it's about power. So he wished to be prime minister. He woke up and he was prime minister and he was grown. And they said, Mr. Prime Minister, we have a problem. And people from where you grew up are at the door to see you. And he said, went to the door and there were his family and friends all poor in tattered clothing. He said, oh my gosh, I forgot to wish for anything for you. So then he went back to the well. Well, he was grown, right? So he said, oh my gosh, I forgot to wish for anything for you. So then he went back to the well and he said, this time I wish that everybody's happy. And I actually drew the picture of me driving myself back to the well, but it was, I was writing for my audience. So I drove my uh, white kid, right? Because my class was mainly white. I was the only black kid, right? And there was one other black kid at that in another class, right? Um, so anyway, the point is this book was prophetic that I wrote in grade five in 1988, two years after I started reading the Bible, December 1st, 1986. And the, he went back to the well and he said, this time I wish everybody's happy, not just me. And he woke up and he was a kid again but his family and friends weren't poor anymore. That was the end of the story. Okay, and now I did work in politics. I served in the party that's now in power and I helped Paul Martin's campaign. Now he didn't get elected. He was prime minister for a little bit of time. I helped him in his reelected election campaign in English and French. And this was before prime minister John Cretchen. You know, you might not know these people, but this was in 19, in 2000. And you know, this was before, I think it was after I worked at Microsoft 2004. Uh, no, before 2002. Oh, it was around then. Then I got out of politics because I got accepted to law school, but I decided not to go because Bill Gates Jr. dropped out. And my dad wanted me to go to law school, but I said, Dad, you know, Bill Gates Jr., Bill Gates, a founder of Microsoft, dropped out of Harvard instead of Microsoft. So I decided to be an entrepreneur because my dad was broke at a time because he had got let go when he drove taxi. Last 25 years of life, tried to hurt himself twice. Right you know, hurt himself, like, you know, I, just because of trigger warnings. So I'm an expert in mental health. Last 25 years, I've read all the books on mental health. Law of Happiness by Dr. Henry C. Cloud. 66 books of the Bible over and over again, from front to back, many times since December 1st, 1986. So I could pick out the stories. So the story that I said of give God glory, that you consider yourself to be like Moses. He was brave after he accepted god's calling after he spent time alone with god that was very important right david did that with the sheep and the bears daniel was daniel's the best in terms of wisdom okay because he wasn't doing the baby making thing because he was a eunuch i wasn't doing the baby making thing all of these years so at 45 i'm retired and it's funny but you would be like this if you read the bible since not great since you were nine and you believed every word you read, and you read it multiple times. Then you would get the top of your class every single time if that was your gift, if that was your calling, and this is my calling. So in other words, I try to stay out of trouble. At least I don't speak too fast in front of cops because the amount of times I've seen myself get abused on this app for doing the same thing I'm doing now, because people say, oh, well, he doesn't stop. I have my book course written but people don't want to read it. So then I go on talks. Now I retired from having my own talks and I retired from full-time work and I still love to minister. When I was at Microsoft, they nicknamed me Preacher and they weren't Christian. It was a, they, to them, it was a bad thing, but God thinks it's a good thing. 
the first thing I wanted to be in grade five was a minister. And then kids are so impressionable. So my grade five friend, Steven said, Jason, we played baseball together. He said, my dad was my coach and made me the MVP. My father taught me how to study and learn how to beat, right? So my grade five friend, Steven said, Jason, you got the best marks in class. You only want to be a minister? So he thought it was sinister to be a minister. You know, that's the highest calling. So I put prime in front of minister. So then the next time when they asked, I said, I wanted to be prime minister. And that's why I studied economics. That's why I learned English and French. Well, no, I learned English and I would have learned French anyway, because it's bilingual. My dad wanted us to learn both languages, but I kept taking French and I studied at University of Quebec and Chicoutimi. I did an exchange and lived with a separatist family because the biggest thing in Canada is keep the country together. The biggest thing in the United States is keep the country together too. It's the divided States of America. So that's why most of our prime ministers speak French. We had one exception. He was an economist, Stephen Harper. Uh, Prime Minister Stephen Harper, you learn French on the job, but I'm black. I have to be qualified before I get the job. So, don't show up a party front set. So, in other words, because I was reading the Bible since December 1st, 1986, God called me. I was the son of a scholarship winner. My dad, they said, they used, used to say that my dad was so smart and as smart as paying attention that they were going to read about him in the papers. They thought he was going to be Prime Minister of Canada. Now, in Canada, you can't immigrate and become Prime Minister. It's not like the United States where, you know, Donald Trump was lying about Barack Obama saying he wasn't li- he was born in Kenya, so he would disqual- be qualified, but disqualified, but he was born in, in Hawaii. It's not like the United States. I do believe in our Constitution you can be an immigrant. But they were just saying because he was so smart. But, but my dad died poor. He didn't get to retire. He was 70. And I finished reading the Bible beside his hospital bed on November 27th. 2014, and he died. So I can talk about a lot of different things, but the major thing, I want to honor my father, God, and my dad, because he taught me well, right? And listen, he didn't become prime minister, but he might have raised one. I wouldn't run until 2030. I think, and this is the principle, and this I can, this is the best quote God gave me. And if you, if, if you ever think, even if you think I'm not, you know, when people think they can't follow or whatever, that's what happened in the last talk. And they get defensive and they say, oh, well, you know, maybe it's you. Like they say, it's me, right? But if you do what you are created to do, what you create will do what you create it to do. So I created Penn's Power Club, my company, to help people rise, to be healthy, wealthy, and wise and live their God-given dreams. I wrote my dream in grade five. I just said what it is. And if I was created to be prime minister, you can't stop it. If I wasn't, I'm the only one that can stop it. This is another thing. You know the only one that can stop you from doing what God created you to do? You. Thank you, Mr. Jason. And from my lips to your ears, everything you said is relevant. You know, no matter what people say, you know, you have to listen to what people say to pull out what it is that they're trying to get to. But everything you said is relevant. I understand everything you said. And God bless you for what you said about comparing me to Moses when he said he couldn't talk. I say that because, you know what, let me stop it right there. Let me go back. When I keep telling people that I ran, and since Mr. Jason brought it up, like I said, my life is an open book. I don't care. Because he brought it up, let me explain what I meant by that. When I said I ran, I had visions of speaking in the pulpit, probably 18, 19, I'll probably say 20. I had the visions where I go to sleep and I'm having these visions of me preaching in a pulpit. And I'm like, uh, no, no, you know what, God, you got jokes. But no, that's not me. And you know, that's not me. And that's when that's when the avoidance started. So for if I'm in my mid 40s, so for 20 some odd years, I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. Do you know I don't like people? I don't like talking to people. And the last thing I want to do is talk in front of people. So I get to school, I get to college, not paying attention, you know, being young, just getting away from the house, going to college. And the first year I saw my transcript and it said early childhood education. And I'm like, uh, no, that falls under the teachers. And why am I going to teach somebody's bad butt children? I'm 20. I'm single. I have no kids. Not thinking of kids. Why would I want to be early childhood education? Not happening. Fast forward 18 years. No, I didn't see. Look, I can't even name. Look, there go that public school education. Three years. 2003. Had my first child. 
before he was three or four months old, probably six months old, I'm standing in front of the church accepting my calling. Why? Because God saw what I was capable of, even though I didn't see it. He saw in me what I didn't see. And he saw, yes, yeah, she's right. She ain't going to be able to stand in front of people. But if I let her do it the way she wants to do it, she'll still get the message across. So I love that even though I ran from him so many years ago, I still ended up doing what he wanted me to do. But the thing about it is I'm doing it in a way where it makes me comfortable to do it, but I'm still doing what my calling was. And the irony to that is two years ago, I graduated with my associates in early childhood education. And it it just ain't got good. Just just look at what it did because the ministry I started is doing what? Teaching. Even though I may not say it, I may say mentor and I may say counselor, but what you're doing is teaching. So what he wanted me to do 20 years ago, I'm doing it now. So it goes back to that coulda, woulda, shoulda. If I'd done what he wanted me to do 20 years ago, where would I be now? Would my ministry be even farther than it is now had I done what he asked me to do 20 years ago? So that explains the part about me running. That's what I was running from because this is what he wanted me to do, but I didn't see myself as a public speaker. Now, I can speak to people in small groups, you know, because we all just sitting around shooting the breeze. But standing in a pulpit, looking at people, and they're looking at me? Uh Uh-uh. But, once again, conquering that fear. Just like me singing in front of large groups of people. I got a way I can conquer that too. So he found a way for me to conquer speaking in front of large groups of people because what he wants me to do was more important than my fear of doing it. And I'm like, you know what? You led me this far. I'm going to continue to follow. Lead on. And like I said, I'm playing catch up now. I'm not on wisdom probably as much as people want me to be. Um, as much as I want to be, because I'm at that point now where another door has opened and I'm trying to figure out how to do all this. Like I said, he does not put no more on you that you can bear. He knows I'm a multitasker. I can do six or seven things and have a board meeting in my head with 20 people yelling at the same time and still get stuff done. That's me. But it's the point of, again, because I waited so long to do what he asked me to do, those blessings that were backed up behind that door are now overflowing. Because I'm continuing to do what he's calling me to do. And each time I go through one door, the next one opens. Then the next one opens. So I'm playing catch up. And that's okay. Because he's right there beside me too. So if I'm if I start to get overwhelmed, it's amazing how he makes life slow down enough for me to recharge, rethink, reconnect, and start back out again. That is the power of our father. But we have got to get this world back. Because it's only going to get worse if we continue to be quiet. It's only going to get worse if we do not use that calling to do what we're supposed to do. Like I said, it's not necessarily to the pulpit. You may have the the gift of gab where you can talk to somebody and you just motivate them by saying three or four words and they're ready to up and jump and run and do what you want them to do. You may have the gift of prayer where you can pray the evil out of somebody. You know, you may have the gift of song where you can release the burdens of somebody through your singing. Each one of us has something we need to do, but we all need to join together and do it because our youth need us. It's our youth that are taking out other youth. It's our youth that are taking out adults. We need to grab hold of those people, you know, and like Mr. Adam, those people who may not have had people in their life to help them along the way. Well, he's got me now. I may not can't fix what happened in his past, but I'm going to walk with him right now into the future. We need to grab those people who turn their lives around in spite of. And I'm one of those people. I'm one of those people who friends didn't, their their parents didn't want them nowhere around me because I was a bad influence. Why? Because I wanted to stay by myself because I like being alone. I didn't know what about it could have been the way I looked. Who knows? But I had friends of my, well, not friends, people I knew whose parents said I was a bad influence. And I'm like, well, what the heck did I do? But that didn't stop me. You know, I still did what I needed to do. You know, you was with me, you was with me. If you weren't, you weren't. And if you were with me without your parents knowing, that would be our little secret. Because I'm not going to cause problems in your happy home. But again, it's time to take back what the devil stole, but it starts with us. Those young people that you see, that you know are needing help, help them. 
those young people that you see that there's something about them that's changed, even if it's a little bit, where they used to smile a lot, they're not smiling so much. Find out what's going on. Something is going on that their parents probably don't know about. They need to hear from us. We need to step up and help these young people. But at the same time, let's not forget the older people. Let's not forget our seniors. As we get older, we still need guidance. We still need mentors. Just because you're grown and an adult does not make you more intelligent than thou. You still need somebody you need to talk to every once in a while. When the job gets on your nerves, when the kids have drawn you crazy, when you want to ring the Holy Ghost into your husband or your significant other, you got to have some way to release all of that tension, all of that anger. I am notorious wherever I work. When I saw coworkers supposed to get upset, uh-uh, come with me. Come on, we're supposed to go take a walk. Let's go, let's go. Let's take a stroll. We take them out the building. And I let them cuss up a storm till they cuss themselves to laryngitis. I let them get it out. I never took it personally because they weren't talking to me. But I'd rather you cuss at me than you do something in that office building where you lose your job. You know, I'd rather you take it out with me as we're walking, yell, cuss, scream, kick the tree. I don't care what you do, but I'd rather you do it out here than to make a mistake in there. And it may cause you to lose your job, cause you to be demoted, cause you to be suspended, cause you to have a mark in your work record where it may hinder you getting a better job somewhere else. That is the kind of person I am. No, I'm not supposed to do that. And I don't care if it's got something to do with me or not. You're not going to do it in front of me. I know that much. No, we're not. We're not supposed to do that. No, 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 no. If you want to ruin your life, if you want to just cuss to be cussing because you just done had enough, you need to do when I'm not around. That way I can't stop you. Other than that, I'm going to walk right behind you. Excuse you. I'm going to need you to tone that down just a tank. It's not that serious. I'm going to need you to breathe, first of all, because I can't be hollering for you because the ambulance won't know who to help you or me. I'm going to need you to calm it down. Bring it down a notch. But like I said, that's just the person I am. And we, we, people think once you get older that you get out of these situations. No, you don't. They just become adult situations. Like I told my youth, your sins and my sins are different. Your sins are child size. My sins are adult size. Your temptations are child size. My temptations are adult size. Your bullying is child size. My bullying is adult size. We go through the same thing y'all go through. It's just that the age difference. That's it. And for some of the gender, some of the age, some of the, oh, it's just so many issues. But the youth need to see, you know, longer the days where we did something in private, not letting the youth see what's going on. No, they need to see. They need to see that they're not facing this alone, that we're still facing it too, even though we're grown. We don't need them to think that once they become an adult, their problems will, will be over with. No, no, they get worse, really. And I tell them that, like I said, I'm being honest. Your problems don't get, they don't get no better. They get worse. Which is why you need to stop it at the door before it gets to that far, because we can't, we can't afford that. We can't afford to lose no more young people. We can't afford to lose no more anybody. We need everybody on here to act like they got some form of common sense, even if they feel like they don't have it. We need you to have some form of common sense to help those, you know, who are needing that help, who have been looking for that help, who have been longing for that help, who are literally walking out that door saying today, if this doesn't get resolved, to heck with everybody. I'm going out in a blaze of glory. No, we don't need you doing that. But no, we don't. We don't need you doing that. So we have Mr. Jason again coming to us to enlighten us some more. Yes, Mr. Jason. I, I'll try to ask you a question because mental health definitely those kids that go wild and out. I've talked to them, and you know what? The suicide rate is so high. There was a 15 year old girl that used to go to our church. And um, she stopped coming. And, you know, you can't, well, I, maybe you can, I, you, but I don't run after the girls to find out what happened. I just assume maybe she went to another church. Turn out she got depressed. She was hanging out with the wrong crowd. I don't know exactly the details, but she jumped off a second story building. And God is gracious. So I've, I've met people that have tried to kill themselves 20 times. Okay. My dad tried twice. Um, I did contemplate. And I use Joyce Meyer's example. I did contemplate whether it was good to tell people my dad's story or not. And I do think that my dad would want me to just tell the truth. Okay. So and it's up to me. 
obviously what I say. Um, I don't think it helps people if I just pretend my dad was perfect because, you know, I honor my father so much with my poem, right? I don't know if you heard it before because I didn't say the whole of it, but my dad was a scholarship winner. My dad was so smart in Antigua. And this is all relevant, right? I'll get to the point where, um, you know, you see the connection. But obviously, it's the connection is obvious. If my dad tried to hurt himself, I picked up a 911. I had to call 911 for my own father because he left me a, a note that said he overdosed on his antidepressants. And he said he was sorry. and He was crying. He said he wanted to stick around for me, but he just couldn't do it anymore because it was so depressing for him. The last 25 years of his life, slaving for him, it was slaving, driving taxi. He wouldn't get enough sleep. So this this is for people because I've heard people say that they'll sleep with their dead because I'm an entrepreneur and I go into entrepreneurship rooms and clubhouse and some of them are not Christian and some of them are Christian, but you know, it's the hustle. It's the grind. It's you've seen it. You'll see it on social media. Some people are like, Oh yeah, I'll sleep when I'm dead. That's a good way to get dead. Okay. It's a very bad thing. And I'm just going to say, cause I didn't get enough sleep and I went to the psych ward too. So some people say, oh, you're bragging so much. And then I said, well, no, I went to the same psych ward as my dad because I didn't get enough sleep. And then I was trying to get out of exams in 1998. So I went to the same psych ward as my dad, Centenary Hospital in Toronto. Right? So then people say, oh, why are you bragging so much? And then I say, well, I went to the psych ward. And they say, oh, that's why. It's so uh, frustrating, okay? So then they're like, oh, then they're scared of me. I remember my ex. I told the story about my dad. They said, why should he be saying that about his father? So so her brother judged me first because I was an entrepreneur next because I told, I said my story, my dad was depressed, went through depression. So then he said, well, if that's what if the same thing happens to me and now I sold my house and now because we're not getting married because we broke up in January and it was only because she was church of Christ and I got, you know, I didn't understand that she believed that that's the only right church. And she's entitled to that belief. She's definitely saved, I, I believe. But that doesn't mean that she's right. <laughs> I'm, I'm also a Christian, right? Even though I was baptized as a baby and then I got baptized in a Seventh-day Adventist church when I came out of the psych ward. Do you see the connection? I came out of the psych ward in 1998. I hadn't slept enough. I went to the psych ward to get out of my exams because I was scared I was going to fail and I wanted to prevail and graduate top of my university like I graduated top of my elementary school and top of my high school. So that was a lot of pressure I put on myself, right? They said my dad was going to be prime minister Canada. I knew he wasn't going to be, but I wanted to be. So I wanted to get graduate top of my class in university too. University of Toronto is a little bit harder. But I definitely wasn't going to do it. I figured if I went to those exams, because I went to my grandmother's funeral in Antigua, and I had read the Bible to my grandmother. So, you know, my dad said, oh, when I realized I didn't have that much time because I had four exams, microeconomics, microeconomics, stats, and another one. The other one was not that hard because I don't even remember what it was. But macroeconomics is how you judge the economy. It's very important for, for a prime minister. Right, microeconomics is so you understand how a business works. Like I have to work my small business so that I could retire, and I did now. So stats is very important because then I understand one of the problems with the African American community why we're still in poverty is because they had us, you know, not able to own property, and then there was redlining, and then what they did was the war on drugs didn't help. They lock us up for the same things that other people do. Like our prime minister smoked weed when it was illegal. Justin Trudeau, his dad, he had confessed it. He admitted it, right? Barack Obama admitted it too, and he became president. But there's some people still in prison for doing the same as Barack Obama did, as Bill Clinton did, <laughs> right, when it was illegal. And then our prime minister, Justin Trudeau, his dad was prime minister. He admitted that he smoked weed when it was illegal. Right? So, so if you're son of the prime minister, you can smoke weed when it was illegal and become prime minister and make it legal. Because that's what Justin Trudeau did. He confessed. And I'm not against the prime minister. I voted for him. But it's true. He smoked weed. He admitted it. He smoked weed when it was illegal. He wasn't always, he, I, he doesn't confess as Christian now either. 
but he wasn't always planning to be prime minister. He used to drink in college and he smoked weed. Okay. And then he got serious after he was a drama teacher. Then he got serious after and because of his name, right? It was, it was able to bring him to fame. And they also said he was good looking. I don't know how that's relevant, <laughs> but it is, it is actually, they've done studies. It's pretty privileged. They've done studies. If the person looks good, they're more likely to elect them. In fact, with Hillary Clinton, they said they didn't like how she was so tough. They wanted somebody they could have a beer with. So yeah, they could have a beer with Donald Trump, <laughs> okay? And then he'll do an insurrection. Like, it's weird, people's values. The biggest problem in society is people's values. It's the biggest problem. People value money more than God. They think money makes the world go round. That's also a little bit why my dad felt so much pressure because he wasn't making that much money as a taxi driver. Right, last 25 years of his life. So he didn't get to retire. He was driving taxi. He would work 20 hours straight. When I was a kid, I was I was delivering the Pickering News Advertiser. That's the same city I'm in now, in a motel, because I sold my house, right, for a million dollars three months ago. I bought it for $500,000, so I retired, owning more web, web domains. They're more valuable than I have owned the most valuable web domains in the world. People can't steal them from me. My web designer is my only staff. He's Big Nesh. He lives in India in Mumbai. And then some people say, oh, why don't I play, uh, employ an American? I would have lost my house faster. If I employed an American, you think anybody would work for $300 a month? All the websites and webs uh, Big Nesh designed, if you go to PetsPowerClub.com, Big Nesh designed that. If you go to FreeScholarships.com, so P-H-R-E, that's my scholarship program, Big Nesh designed that. And by the way, I went on, I went on Clubhouse when I got let go, I went on Clubhouse and tried to sell my book course I put together, Your Gift is So Think Freely, the course from 96 to 2021. I wanted to give scholarships. I want to teach kids the seven principles of one state. Let me seven scholarships. Not giving them $25,000, but a $25,000 scholarship, they apply. I did it last year. I launched it. You know what? Only my ex, my girlfriend was the one. She's the only one that could do her target resume. It's the first step of the seven steps of entrepreneurship millions. Everybody, universally. Your target resume is what you want your resume to look like when you're 120. You want to know how I retired at 45? I wrote my target resume in 1999 after I finished working at Microsoft Canada. So I said, well, I want to run my own corporation so that I'm not like my dad, dependent upon the system, because I know how the system works. It doesn't. Okay? So and I'll say that as prime minister. I know how the system works. It doesn't. So we have to try to make the system work better. If the system worked, George Floyd wouldn't have gotten killed. The system doesn't work, right? So it's funny because I, I did everything they said to do, right? I'm the kid that did everything his parents said to do. And then I tried to do everything everybody else said to do. And that's why I, I, it almost drove me crazy, honestly. Even on this app, look, people say, talk slower. And they say, well, wait, give people time, right? And then they say, oh, don't bring up race. When one girl said that, why do you talk about race so much? I believe there's one race, a human race. And then she said, I said, well, what's the solution to the violence? She said, um, we should just smile and be positive. She was brown. I don't understand. And then she said, I don't have anything against brown people. My Vignesh is brown. He wants to come to Canada. And you better believe that if anybody tries to get Vignesh to do something, they would have to steal my phone. It has face recognition, right? So my wealth, right? They'd have to chop off my head. And then when I'm dead, Vignesh will not design the websites. So I'm one of the richest people in the world, but I give away everything. I go on people's talks and then they're like, oh, you don't let me talk. I'm like, everybody's talking, talking, talking. What would you do if you had all of the answers and you try to lead people to Christ? What would you do? Thank you again, Mr. Jason. I love that he has this passion. And for those who don't understand him, for those who think he talks fast, my son talks just as fast. I talk fast. I have to teach myself how to slow down. But I understand everything he's trying to say. I mean, like he said, it may take him a minute to get to his point, but I already know where he's going with it. And I understand. And I agree. But we're back to, we need to accept the call. Whatever that calling may be, every last one of us has a calling. Like Mr. Jason, who has been blessed with so many gifts of businesses. You know, probably all of us on here has a business or two or three. I think I calculated I now have, well, three legally that, that the, and then, well, okay, let me back up. Let me refer to say, I'm not doing nothing illegal. So let's fix say I'm not doing nothing illegal. But I have a couple, you know, I sing, I'm a poet, 
I'm an author. I'm a counselor. I'm a motivational speaker. I'm a good googly moogly. I'm just about everything. Never not working. And like Mr. Kevin said, Kevin, Lord, I don't rename the man. Like Mr. Jason said, you know, all of that takes time away. Sleep. I still got a full-time job. I'm still doing what I need to do until God tells me with this particular business, you can let that main job go because I need you to focus on this because I know the day that he tells me that he's going to take care of that supplemental income that I'll lose from that full-time job. So I'm not worried about it. I'll keep doing what I do. I'm up to mostly midnight to get back up again at 4.30 in the morning to be at work by 5.15. So working an eight-hour day, and then comes everything after because you still got a household. I still got children. I still got grandchildren. I still got children in my ministry that may call on me. I still got the people that I do regular calls for. Then I'm going to start a thing like Mr. Jason said. Um, I'm going to start a little platform, too, where I'll start having one-on-ones with people because that's what I have on Sundays with certain people. I put set time aside on Sundays and have one-on-ones with people. That's where you have that one-on-one time where if a sermonate is what they want, a sermonate is what they're going to get, but it's tailored to them. So they can truly say that preacher was just talking to me. Well, I am talking to you because I'm talking to just you. I'm working on um, another person, working with another person where we can go, where we can go to somebody's house. Like that's how it used to be. Some of these churches started in a house before they got a building. And I'm all about going back to doing that. I mean, as long as they're okay, we got masks on, we can have masks on. If I got to stand outside while you inside, whatever. Like I said, I go to where the people are. It's all about making people comfortable, but still doing what we were called to do. So that's some of the things that are coming down the pike. Glory to God after running for so long and waiting, like I told you, four years, doing what I was supposed to do, that the blessings are now overflowing because I'm finally getting done with everything he wants me to do. God bless me to have my ministry become a nonprofit. I'm going to shout and bring out my tambourine just on that alone, because a lot of things that me and the hubby were doing, we were coming out of our pocket, you know, blessing the kids for back to school, blessing the kids with clothes, blessing the kids with food, you know, because I'm a baker. I bake them stuff on their birthday and mail it to them, bake them stuff for Christmas. And so now God has blessed me spiritually, emotionally, especially financially to open to start this nonprofit. It's the ministry I've had for over 20 years, but now it's a nonprofit ministry. So it's now Next Generation Ministries, Inc. So now we're able to do more to help more. And that's only because of the glory of God. But like I said, because I waited so long, I'm playing catch up. But I'm going to keep up. I'm going to do what I need to do. It's God that gives me the strength to go to bed at midnight to get back up at four to do my job until to do my job eight hours later, to get off, take a quick little nap, get up, and I got to take care of the household. You got to feed the kids. You got to make sure the bills are paid. You got... He does not put no more on us than we can bear. And like I said, I can multitask. So it's just a point of when he gives me that one downtime where he shuts everything down. I can't do nothing. He won't let me do nothing. That's the time that he gives me to plan out. This is what you need to do first. This is what you need to do next. So for those of us who think that there's not enough time in a day, yes, it is. We just need to coordinate it just right. He knows what you can do. You know what you can do. It's just the point of you're being overwhelmed because you make it that way. What I've always told people is God don't call you to do something and it stresses you out. It gives you a heart attack. It raises your blood pressure. That ain't God. That's you. Because he told you to do one thing and you compounded it with other things. That's your problem, not his. He told you what to do. You the one decided they thought you could tack on three or four other more projects. No, you can't. That's not what he told you to do. So I stand here today once again to tell you that it's time to take back what the devil stole. It's time for us to pay attention to these youth. Look into your families. Look into your family's friends, your best friend's kids, your nieces, your nephews. It's time to look in on those kids and find out what's going on. Check on your adult friends, you know, that are stressed out. Some people are losing their mind going back to in-person. They are not liking it. They loved it when they were remote. You're having more people quitting their jobs because they're being forced to go back to in-person and they're not, they're not liking it. They're not, they're not getting along with that. So it is time for us to take back what the devil stole. And it's also time for us to pay attention. It's time for us to wake up. The world is not going to heal itself. We need to jump in there and do something. It is time for us to accept that calling, do what 
gift that God gave us to do and do it to the best of our ability. Once you start, God's going to help you along the way. Again, I'm a living witness that he'll send people along your path. I would not have gotten to where I was if along the way, when I thought I have no clue what I'm doing, here comes this angel. Here comes this thing through an email. Here comes this thing through a text that gives me the next length of what I need to do. And it comes right on time. I get something in the mail like, I was just thinking about this. That sparked something in my mind. And like, oh, I can do it this way. He will give you what you need when you need it. But first, you got to be ready for it. First, you got to be able to accept it. Then you got to be able to receive it. But most of all, you better be ready to act on it. Because what he gives, he will take away. I'm telling you that as a witness too. What he gives you, he will take away if you do not do what you're supposed to do with it. What I was sent here to do is to save souls however I can do it, going to them. I'm not expecting them to come to me. I don't want them to come to me. I need to go to them. Do I have something against them coming to me? No. But just like Jesus went amongst the people, even the ones that people didn't want to have nothing to do with, I'm no better than nobody else. I can go to you. When he found me, I wasn't in the church when he when he snatched my soul and told me, look here, you know better. I wasn't in the church. I wasn't nowhere near the church. It wasn't even Sunday. So I know that there are a lot of people that are like me. So I need to go where they are. My babies. My babies are my angels now because they got friends. And sometimes they come and talk to me on behalf of the friend. Okay. Or they're talking because they see something and they want my, that's fine. I make sure I tell them exactly what they need to know so they can exactly repeat it to the friend. And if it turns into something else, they'll send them to me. I got no problem with that. Like I said, I got more babies than the law should allow. And that's okay. You know, babies need love. Adults need love. We all need love. So in case you hadn't heard it lately, I love you. I love you to pieces. Yes, I do. You're just as precious as you want to be. And you are worth more than you give yourself credit for. So again, if you don't hear from nobody else, you just heard it from me. And I don't have to know you to love you. Trust and believe me on that. I don't have to know you to love you. But I love you. And I know that you are gifted. I know that you are talented. And I know you just needed that kick to get started on what you know you needed to do. Because you know that your blessings are coming. It's just that you're afraid to take that first step. Let me be here for you. The person who's afraid of speaking in front of people, singing in front of people, doing anything in front of people. For the Let me be the first to say, Mm-mm, don't let fear take away your joy. Because in the end, you're going to be so joyful. You're going to be so blessed that it, you ain't going to have room to hold it all. So I love you. I love you. I love all of you. Every part of you. I don't care what your sex, your race, your gender, your creed. Your eye color, your hair color, your religion. I don't care. Want to know why? Because Jesus didn't care what I look like when he chose to die for me on the cross. So why do I need to care who I love? I don't. I love you. I love you for who you are and who you were meant to be. It is in my time. In my time zone, it is now 9.56 and I got babies I need to put to bed because I know that's an excuse for still being awake. So as always, let me leave you with you need to be that light in someone else's darkness. You want to get with me? Hit me up. I think my email is listed on the Wisdom app. Send me questions all the time. Send it to me. Like I said, I'm not on wisdom as much as I would like to be, but I'm going to work on that too. That's something else God is working with me on. I had time today because the family is downstairs looking at a movie. So that gave me time to come upstairs and and do this. And I'm glad I did because we covered a lot. I know some souls have been blessed. I know some minds have been motivated. I know some people have been inspired. So get out there, claim our world back, get those babies, get those adults. Check on your seniors. It is time for us to be called into action. And I'm going to say it again. Love you, love you, love you, love you, love you. So that should carry you for the rest of the week because at least you know one person loves you without judging you. You care less. I love you for who you are and what I know you're going to be. Amen.
Let us pray. Father God, I come here today to say thank you. Thank you, Father, for blessing this speech today. Father, thank you for Brother Jason coming and giving us the gift that you bestowed upon him. And Father, I thank you that we were able to touch Brother Adam. Father, we pray that those that are hearing me under the sound of my voice, Father, now will take up their sword and shield and stand at the ready and fight in your name. Father, we pray for the youth and young adults, Father, today who feel that they are lost, that no one is listening, that no one is caring. Father, we pray that somebody will go out there and grab those babies and let them know that you are worth fighting for. Father, we thank you for everything that you have done. Father, we pray that those under the sign of my voice will use that gift. Father, whatever it may be to help more souls reach the kingdom. Father, we know that there are some of those who have that gift that are afraid to take that first step because they don't know what that may entail. But Father, I give you the honor and the glory and in the blessed name of Jesus, let them know that Father, you will not leave them, that you are there every step of the way. All you have to do is call out their name. Father, I thank you for everything that you've done in my life. Let me overcome my fears. Let my past not control my future. I am grateful that I'm here to save as many souls as I can in the way, Father, that you know my gift can do. But Father, I know that this is just the beginning. And I'm here, I'm willing, and I'm ready. Father, we praise you. We honor you. We give you all the glory. In your son Jesus' name, amen. Until we meet again, which Lord knows with me, who knows when that'll be. (laughs) But don't give up on me. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. This Today has been so inspiring, so fulfilling to have so many guests who come with different walks of life, different paths, who came through different things to overcome and become the children of God that they are, means that this app for me is doing what God wanted me to do, speaking to people, getting further out reaching more people in different continents, different time zones, different places, that confirms me to me that I am doing what God called me to do, that I'm still doing what God called me to do, but I know I'm not in this by myself. So again, I thank you for joining me. And until we meet again, as always, always be that light in someone else's darkness. Stay safe, stay blessed.